Okay, thank you everyone for coming uh, to today's Hyman Cafe. Uh, today we have uh, Megan Pranty with us. Okay, uh, she's a graduate from Fraser University, uh, registered RM RMT, so RMT. Um, 500 hour yoga instructor. Um, she also runs her own business, uh, Sentient Body. Uh, so she's here to talk about health and wellness. Okay, all right. Ready? Yeah. Okay, sure take it away. Okay. We have a lot to cover today. So if for some reason you can't hear me, you can like do one of these because sometimes I get really into what I'm doing and I'm quiet. So if you can't hear me, let me know. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to just shoot a hand up. I will try to stop and check in as we go, but there's a lot to cover. So if you have questions, let me know. Um, that's me. Um, so, as Adam said, I'm a registered massage therapist. I'm also a yoga teacher. I've been working professionally full time in the health and wellness industry for the last 12 years. Um, I do a lot. I work a lot with bodies and I see them in all different shapes. And about four years ago, I started to find that I was finding people with the same concerns over and over again people with chronic pain, headaches, low back pain, like just uncomfortable and wanting to feel better. So I started doing talks like this to give people usable tools so that they can make themselves feel better as we go. Um, yeah, so I try to use my background. I have a lot of health sciences behind me because I'm not busy enough. I'm currently undergoing a second undergrad in health sciences. So the continuing education always, always keeps going and I try to sort of package it together. So this presentation I tried to put together specifically for your guys' needs. <coughs> So we're going to talk a little bit, starting uh, with food. I know, uh, you know it's tough with the international laws going over the border, and what you can bring and what you can't bring, and just long hours of sitting, long stretches, you're probably trying to you know, get where you need to be, and food can really be a lower priority on the list, right? And then we start grabbing quick things, and then those quick things are often high in sugar, high in fats, but not the good ones and then we feel crappy, and then because we feel crappy, we move less and we get on this bad cycle. So one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about was just some overall general things to think about with being on the road and food. Um, one of the big ones is staying hydrated. We all know that we're supposed to drink water. Most of us don't drink anywhere near enough. So we're gonna do some mental math together. Take your body weight in pounds, roughly, Divide that by two, so 50% of your body weight. Then take that number, we're gonna divide it by 10, so you're moving your decimal over. That's how many glasses, eight ounce glasses of water you should be having in a day before alcohol and before coffee. So most of us hear that and go, oh, I'm not doing anywhere near what I should, right? And we all know, yes, I should drink water, but what a lot of us don't really understand is why. So. Our bodies are made out of between 67 and 71% of water, a little, little higher water density in women than men. And we need that. We need that to circulate the blood to our tissues. If that doesn't happen, we don't stay alive, right? So it is one of our main priorities to do that. When we don't intake enough water to circulate through the body like that, the body pulls it out of pre-existing tissues. So most of us have seen beef jerky at some point in our life. That's really over-exaggerated, but that's dehydrated muscle. So if you think about pulling a piece of beef jerky out of a package, what do you do? You like break it and it just rips, right? Now that's not exactly what happens when you're dehydrated to your muscles, but to a lesser degree, that's what's happening. It's like the Tin Man. We have to give him oil or he's just gonna break. And the muscles kind of do that too. So when we get dehydrated, one of the places our body pulls that hydration out of is the muscle tissue. And it means that we have less lubrication in the muscles. So when we sit with poor posture or putting strain, they're more likely to tear. And the tears are more likely to tear more fibers and be more serious, and then we're in pain we get into other cycles. So that's one place that we take um, water from. Another place that our body takes the water from is the discs. So 25% of your height from your spine just comes from those little discs. They basically work like the brake pads in your trucks. When they are dehydrated, they flatten out. And what that means is, is the bones on either side have less of a brake pad. We all know it's not good to let your brake pads go to crap in your car, right? Things aren't going to move smoothly and things start wearing. And that's exactly what happens. Our vertebral height decreases. 
those discs get flatter. And then if you have any sort of you know tears in the discs, right, then, then we potentially have bone on bone, which is very painful, get arthritis and then so you know we don't have that bumper pad. The other thing that's important to notice with discs is we're always taller in the morning. If you've ever had that experience of like you get in your car at the end of the day to go home and you have to change your mirror because the pressure of gravity is pushing through us. And even if we're sitting, it's still coming vertically down through us. And so those discs get more pressure as the day goes on. So if they're already starting at a deflated state, right, you're putting more and more pressure on those surrounding structures through the day goes, and it can be a big contributing factor to back pain, which we'll talk about. One more note on the hydration. The other place that our body will pull it from is our GI tract, which is super important because when we put food in, we need the hydration there to help pull the nutrients and stuff that we need out of our food, right? So you can eat perfectly, but if your gut flora is off and if you're not eating enough water, you might still end up malnourished because you're not able to absorb the vitamins from your food. So, I'm gonna come back and talk about that a little bit more with some of these things. But the big thing about water is most of us are drinking a lot. And I can understand that if you're on the road, it probably sucks to be like, and I have to pee again and stop. It makes your trips longer. But you do kind of want to think of that mental math number and the water that you need to take. Most of us also drink coffee. A uh, quick note on that, tea is not the same as coffee, even though they're both caffeinated. For some reason, key, uh, tea doesn't affect the liver the same way, so it's not a diuretic, which means it won't make you go pee. So apparently, and I just learned this, even drinking water and coffee at the same time won't balance you out because the coffee's going to speed everything up through your processing internally, and you're just going to pee out all that water before it stays in and hydrates the tissue. So if you're a coffee drinker, just try to drink one big cup of water before your coffee in the morning. And then just sort of make a mental note, right? Whatever you drink in coffee, you have to add back in. If when you did that mental math, you're like, wow, I'm really off the water goal, don't try to double or triple your water intake in one day. First of all, all you will do is spend the inside of your day in a bathroom. <laughs> You'll just be running to go pee totally all day. But also, you know, it's, it's gonna be uncomfortable. Just start with adding an extra glass a week and the first easiest way is to just notice spend a week just noticing how much water you actually drink uh, I'm a big schedule person so I like to just get like one of those big one gallon things and I know okay I need to drink two of those in a day so by about halfway through my day I should be done some people work really well with phone alarms it's just habits right so whatever is going to help you to drink more water it can be really hard this time of year it's cold it's damp it's wet and it's cold and wet out there, we don't want to. Um, there's no reason you can't have slightly warm water. I know lots of people who boil water and they'll just have warm water with their meals. It's great for your digestion. It can help actually if you have digestive ailment. Um, you know, flavored water, put fruit in your water, play with stuff, but water is one of those really big things that's gonna help you right off the get-go. Not only is it gonna improve digestion, it's gonna reduce muscle pain, it clears up a lot of brain fog and stuff, so you feel, you know, you get a little daisy and just a little out there. It just helps kind of keep everything together. So it's one of the easiest ways to feel better fast. And for those of you on the road, you've got your fridges, so you can have nice cold water with you at all times. And you can take it over the border, so there's no problem there. So that is one thing you can do today to feel better. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about was um, drinking your greens. So I know that we had some smoothies come in today and there's a recipe that someone lovingly put together, beaten to it, it was awesome. Um, drinking your greens is one of the great ways to get your vegetables and fruit servings in. I know you guys can't take that stuff over the border, but I, I will make my smoothies the night before and just leave them in the fridge, give them you know, a stir in the morning, chug it down before I get to work, and then you've already gotten some um, you know, vitamins in your day. It's also really good to start your morning with fruit. It helps to wake up the digestive everything, the metabolic processes and your digestive processes. It's not too hard, it's not too heavy. So it's a good way to start the day. Another way to drink your greens is soup. Soup is awesome. It's a really great way, especially in the winter. It's warm, it's comforting. You can put meat and potatoes if that's your thing in it. But it's also a really nice way to sneak, say, kale in, which not everybody loves eating. Um, from there, talking about planning ahead. So there's sort of two strategies to planning ahead. There's the planning ahead when you're on the road, but then there's also planning ahead for the rest of the time. So 
I work in an office, I live locally, but planning ahead is a still a big part of my week. Every Sunday I sit down, I make a menu for the week, I go grocery shopping for the week, and then I spend about two and a half hours to make three adults all of their food for the week. Uh, it sounds like a lot, but then literally the rest of the week I just walk home and I'm like, and it's ready, I just have to heat it up. Uh, I also make other batches as I go. So every week I do a baked good of some kind, so like loaves, muffins, maybe even healthy cookies. My boyfriend ate <laughs> pumpkin chocolate chip cookies for two and a half years before he knew there was pumpkin in them, and he was like, oh, I don't like pumpkin. And I was like, oh, no, no, you do. You eat them every month. They're fine. <laughs> good way to sneak you know, your veggies in, banana breads, zucchini breads, veggies in your things. Uh, I do a soup every week, great way to hide your greens if you don't love making them, usually a stir fry of some kind and a casserole. Even super comfort food, right? Like you can make a shepherd's pie with four or five different veggies hidden in there and you've still got all your meat and your potatoes and the good stuff. And that stuff's really easy to pre-make, freeze, and then when you come home, you have good nutritious food waiting for you. So meal prep, it sounds a little hectic. I didn't start by doing three people, seven days worth of meals, right? I started with, okay, I'm just gonna make a soup. <laughs> I'll have you know dinner for half the week and a snack and slowly built in. But what it does is it means that after a 14 hour work day like today, I can just go home and my dinner is made and it's not that, oh, I was really hungry an hour and a half ago, now I'm starving and I'm just running through the drive-through for the however many of the time this week because I just need to eat, right? Um, planning ahead when you're on the road. Um, I know that there's stuff that you can't take over the border, but knowing where the grocery stores are that are near a route that you can stop at. Most grocery stores will have like a hot cold deli bar, right? So you can get pre-made salads, you can get pre-made soups, you can get pre-made sandwiches or sometimes even tailor your own. And that's going to be better, less processed is always better, right? Like the fast, easy, sugary foods feel good, but then like an hour later, you're still hungry <laughs> and I've consumed how many calories more than I was supposed to and I don't feel well, right so just trying to take in those little things as you go grocery stores even if you're not going and building your own food because that can be hard too you don't want to go buy a bunch of vegetables and then have to throw them out before you come back over the border but you can get those small portioned salads that you know it's still not the same as homemade but it's it's going to be better than the rest of the foods and you'll get more variety which can be really nice too. Um, tracking intake, just having a rough idea of what you eat and how much, because often you're like, oh yeah, it's good. It's like the water thing, you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm good. And then when you actually start to look at it, you realize. So there's lots of free tracking apps that can be really helpful. My Fitness Pal comes to mind. My Fitness Pal is great if you are doing any um, of that stuff because it has a barcode section. So you can literally, if you go to the grocery store or you know, you buy something at like a dip, you can just scan the barcode and it will tell you portion-wise, calorie-wise, what you're consuming. Um, the nice thing about that, I'm not a huge advocate of tracking calories or any of those things, but the nice thing about that is if you do use my fitness pal, you can go into your nutrients and it will tell you if you're consistently really low on vitamin B or whatever, right? Especially if you do find I'm really fatigued all the time, I'm really tired all the time, something's off with my digestion, right? Having problems going to the washroom, either too much, too little, or just pain, right? It's, it's good to kind of know what's happening with your vitamin intake. I can't talk too, too much to that because it's outside of my scope, but those are good places to start to collect data. And we're gonna talk about how to help if you do get a healthcare team, the kind of information that you can provide for them to get you where you need to go as fast as possible. Um, Mindfulness. Mindfulness of food is a big one. Um, I like to think I'm a pretty aware person and I do a lot of mindfulness activity. The last couple of weeks I've been really working on mindfulness with food. And one thing I have noticed, and because I'm aware of it, I'm talking about it with people, we don't chew our food. Most of the time when we're eating, we're on our devices, we're talking to someone, we're watching TV, we're listening to the radio, you might even be driving while you're eating a lot of the time. We don't really pay attention. Chemical digestion actually begins in your mouth. Chewing is that sign to release the amylase and all of these different amino acids that are gonna help start breaking down your food. When we don't chew our food, that doesn't happen in our mouth, which means our gut is trying to play catch up to stuff that should have happened all the way up here. And so then again, you have food that's getting processed through your system that you maybe haven't actually absorbed the nutrients out of. So if nothing else, 
when you're eating, try to reduce your distractions. That doesn't mean that every meal you're gonna be able to sit there and be super present, but try. And at least try to chew your food. I was horribly surprised to find out that you were supposed to chew your food long enough to sing the alphabet in your head. So personal challenge, go do that today. Most of us will notice that like, for me, by like D, I was like, well, I swallowed. Where's all my food? Right, because you just like go, 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 go. So it's one of those things, right? Uh, often, you know, we, we eat because it's comforting or because it's there or it makes us feel a certain way. And that's when we get really into overeating and then having to deal with the damages that that can do. So some mindfulness around your food. Try to make a routine. I know that if you're on the road, you're probably just wanting to get where you are, but it's a good opportunity to take a minute, do a stretch, take 15 minutes to sit and eat mindfully what you're eating and then go on. Um, another, if you really wanna dive into the mindfulness, another really great exercise is while you're eating, try to become aware of all five of your senses. So notice what you're looking at, what you're smelling, what you hear, like even in the unwrapping of your food, the chewing, touch, taste, all of those things. It's a really good thing, because then all of a sudden you're like, oh, right? And lots of us grew up in homes where you eat until your plate is empty, and a lot of us just don't know. We don't really know when we're hungry until you're like, I'm gonna fall down starving. And a lot of us don't know when we're full. So starting to pay attention, that will help in the road too. Any questions? That was a lot. <laughs> okay, on to the next. Okay. This is a story, unfortunately, lots of you will relate to. Uh, it's one of the most common chronic conditions in Canada. Most adults experience it, so four out of five. Um, it, it comes on for different reasons, but it is also an idiopathic injury, which means that it can just kind of come. You might have the most ergonomic setup ever, you might do everything right, and you still might experience back pain occasionally. Hydration is going to help. Right, because we have the, we're already working with the tissues at a neutral level instead of at a disadvantage if you're hydrated. Um, let, let's talk about symptoms. So most of us have experienced this, right? Back pain, muscle tension, stiffness. You might get moving pain always in the same spot, right? A lot of people with low back pain, they'll feel it kind of wrapping around or coming down, even sciatic symptoms down into the leg. I have a lot of, especially drivers, a lot of drivers that come into my practice and they say, I have sciatica, and I go poking around through their glutes. I'm like, no, you don't. You just have a huge knot in your butt. And as soon as I drop an elbow in there for tennis, they're like, oh, I don't have pain going down my leg. But we're not built to sit. We have all this wonderful technology in the world. Now we're sitting all the time, and our core bodies just haven't caught up. Right, so we're going to talk about some movement that you can do, but so nerve symptoms sometimes, especially if there's issues with the discs, you can get traveling pain down the legs, up the back. Intensity varies for everyone. Sometimes there can also be a sense of muscle weakness or muscle fatigue, that like, oh, I go to get up and I feel really unsteady for a few steps, or maybe a, a tingling or a, a numbness feeling almost, that often tells us there's nerve involvement, um, and changes in intensity. So all of these are going to be factors. Sitting is going to be factored. Uh, we see a lot in the ages of 30 to 50, which is going to be a lot of people in this room. Repetitive factors and ergonomics. So like I said, you can have a super awesome ergonomic chair, but we're still sitting. And if you're doing a 12-hour sit or even an 8-hour sit, we're not really built to do that. Think about most of our days, right? You get up in the morning, you go sit in your car, you drive to work. And most of you are out in trucks sitting all day. And you come home and you're beat. So what do you do? You get in your car, you sit to drive home, and you go sit on your couch. So that's it's a lot. And what happens is our bodies are smart, but they adapt. So when I'm sitting in a chair all day, my hips are shortened, right? Because my legs just went from going straight to 90 degrees. So the front of your hips are gonna shorten. And then most of us start to round forward. So the muscles in our back are getting over lengthened. And then the front is, we're very good at adapting, like I said, right? So as we round forward, the body starts to shorten. So we get discomfort and we get chronic pain patterns. Um, also, in chronic pain patterns, once our muscles are kind of like, okay, I don't want to do this anymore, they get knots in them. The fancy technical term for these are trigger points. Trigger points are just muscle knots. Um, but 
basically their definition is a hyper irritable spot that's in a top band of muscle uh, and skeletal muscle. So basically it can apply to everywhere but the stomach, like the, like the digestive tract, not the abs. Um, and it, it's painful either when you touch it or when that muscle moves. So um, that's your basic knock, but when they get really bad, they'll send pain referrals. So these are all of your like really common, like these low back ones, this one would shoot all the way around the side of the body into the front. And that's when people get really scared, right? Because they come in and they're like, a lot of people go to emergency, I have pain coming down my left arm, but it's actually just a trigger point in your neck. That's not to say if you get pain in your arm and you think you're having a heart attack that you shouldn't call the hospital. But a lot of us, we feel pain when we check out, right? Like pain sucks. No one wants to sit in their body and be like, how does that headache feel and really pay attention? So we kind of check out and we disassociate. And then we become what I call like the floating brain where you're like, I have a body, but I don't really want to mentally spend a lot of time in there because it's overtired and it's in pain, like postural pain, and it's dehydrated, and so it doesn't feel nice, right? And that's when we get into these cycles of negative feedback where we're maybe not treating ourselves as well as possible because we've checked out. Pain is important. Not all pain is bad, which is shocking for us to hear, right? Like if you ever have a knee replacement or something, they'll tell you, like, you gotta get up and walk like within 24 hours. And you're like, but it hurts. Our, our natural instinct often is to just either ignore it or avoid it in some, which is kind of the same thing, but the actions can look different. Not all pain is bad. Pain is telling you something. And eventually, if you keep ignoring it, it might go away. But most of the time, if it got bad enough that you've got traveling pain, it's time to do something about it, right? And that's where I get into trouble, and it's a lot of education in my career because people will come and see me. I had a woman once, and we did a 45-minute massage, and he said, how do you feel? And she said, well, I feel good, but I, I feel like I still have a knot in my neck. And I said, well, probably. How long have you been working at a desk? She said, 27 years. I said, okay. When was the last time that you came for a massage? Well, never. Okay, I can only do so much, right? Like you, you, we have to have realistic expectations. But typically, like all things, if you address it sooner, right? Like if you get a hole in your tire, if you just go and patch it, it's going to be better than letting it shred while you're going down the highway. I would assume our bodies are kind of like that too. So these trigger points they become really pesky, right? Because they can stay they can stay constant. Um, and, and like I said, right, there's stuff in the neck that refers down the arm. You can think that things are a lot worse, and it's just muscle pain. Um, we're going to go into, maybe I'll do that right now. Uh, we'll go into some stretching in a bit near the end. I've got some resources for you on that. Any questions about the muscle pain? Okay. So. I, I did make for the drivers some driver specific stretch sheets, but they're arriving before 8 p.m. today and they did not arrive before the talk, of course. So I'll send them next week with Adam and, and for those of you who are out in the field, you can have it. For the desk workers, um, I have some of these for you. We'll just pass these around. These will be good for everybody. Um, but for drivers, no, I have something more specific. This is just a little stretch sheet. There's stuff on two sides. This is specifically for desk workers. It will also apply for truck drivers because you're in this position all day anyways, right? So one side is more for the neck and the upper body. The other side has arms and a little bit of lower body. The sheets that I have coming for the drivers next week will do a lot more with low back because there's so much compression. Um, I should say that Adam told me you guys have those awesome seats. Yes. yes. And that's super helpful because vibration helps to reduce pain signals to the brain and it, vibration will help to break up adhesions a little bit. Um, do you guys need more? I have a big stack of things. Oh, no, there's two. Also, the, the back site where you guys, if you're not aware, on your uh, driver's seats as well. When you open up your cab door and you look, you'll see that little red tag on your driver's seat that lets you set the back cycler. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, essentially when you when you set it, it's real easy to do. It will um, inflate and deflate the airbags in your chair, which promotes blood flow and keeps you from stiffening up when you're driving. So yeah. if, you, if you've never used that, I know most of you probably have, but if you haven't, uh, it's a good thing to utilize. Okay. Yeah, and it, and it will help. There is good science behind it. So so use, use the tools you have. Um, 
you can look at the stretch sheets if you have questions find me after specifically for drivers when I get you the stretches next week you'll see there's a lot in to do with the low back because there is so much compression right like I said you've got gravity pushing through you and like that base of the spine it's like the bottom of the pyramid right those vertebrae are the biggest but all that pressure is coming down into the low back so for drivers really taking the time to open up through the low back um, I got a tour of your trucks there's a mattress in the back right so if you know you're one of those people with low back pain if by the end of your lunch even just taking five minutes to lay down there's a couple stretches like pulling your knee into chest and then doing the other side both knees in twisting twisting is always really good to alleviate pain now this is assuming that there's a healthy back right stretching protocol might change if you know well I have a torn disc or I've had an accident and I've got implants or fusions or anything right like those are kind of special cases this is sort of very generic but it's good to know if you go and you start doing a couple stretches and stretches don't need to be big I always tell people like start small like really small you hold a stretch for 30 seconds you're what did I tell you when I first started seeing you I think I told you pick two minutes a day it's four stretches just start there and we do because it's the New Year's resolution dilemma right you're like I'm gonna be healthy we're all losing that same 20 pounds we all plan to eat perfectly healthy we all have the like I'm gonna to go to the gym for an hour every day and then life happens we don't do it we feel crappy about ourselves then we feel crappy that we've let ourselves down so then we get off the whole wagon and now you know every time you think about it you feel shame and, and gross and so then you never keep working towards your dreams so instead of making it like this big lofty goal literally two minutes and the hardest part is building the habit takes 40 days of repetition to build that neural pathway in your brain for you to remember it. So your best bet in any of these things that you might take away from this, find someone in the office, find another driver, get an accountability buddy, someone who can remind you, or my poor little Google is working hard. It, I have like 8 million Google reminders a day when I'm trying to put new things in. Like, remember you have to stretch now. And I'm like, oh yeah, okay. Because I won't remember on my own. I just won't. I know all this stuff. It's hard to practice what you preach, right? A lot of this isn't going to be new news for you, or the basics won't be. Just remembering to apply it to our lives. Um, good, so stretching stretching will help. Not everything's going to help with stretching, but given the compression, given the nature of how much you're sitting, stretching to, to release through the neck, the upper shoulders, and the low back, probably if you're having postural complaints, help. This is a really big one for all overall health. Um, sleep is super, super important. Consistency is really important. You don't want to have a totally different schedule on the weekends that you do in the week. And most of us hear that and they're like, no, that's our time to catch up. There is some science saying you need between six to eight hours a night to maintain basic heart health. Some science suggests if you get slightly less than that and then you give yourself one really big sleep in day on the weekend, you can recover some of the damage, but not all. Um, but we do see it have a really big impact on heart health. So six to eight hours a night is your goal. Everyone sleeps a little different. There are people in this room who, oh, there are people in my house, right? My partner sleeps 10 to 12 hours a night. I sleep five, <laughs> right? And so it, it can be a negotiation if you have people at home or if you have kids that get you up on a different schedule or like, oh, I gotta wait for them to get off work before I can go to bed, I gotta pick them up before I come home. Right, we do, we have these complex factors in our lives. But you wanna try to get onto a, a schedule that's pretty much similar. Even if your weekends have a different schedule, it shouldn't be more than about an hour, an hour and a half in terms of bedtime and getting up. So try to keep that in mind. Um, <coughs> winding down, preparing for sleep is a big thing, especially because we live in the tech age, right? So it's so easy to just have those LED screens, those backlit screens computers, TVs, cell phones, all the time. Most of our phones now have a setting for blue light filter. You want that to go on about an hour before bed. About an hour before bed, the light should be getting lower and you should be off tech. And a lot of us, that's just not gonna happen that way, but you should be trying to do so. Um, other things, you know, just having a regular sort of routine so that your body starts to go, oh yeah, I know. I know that it's time for bed. 
Um, some people, and I'm totally guilty of this myself, I love my bed, it's super cozy, I've got great blankets, and so I'll come home from work at three in the afternoon and plop myself in and I'll hang out there all day. And then because my brain is like, oh, you're just comfy here. Your bed really should be for sex and sleep. You shouldn't hang out in your bed. That's why you have couches. Hang out on your couch. <laughs> Do, do as I say, not as I do on this one, right? It's a work in progress for all of us, but it makes a big difference, especially if you do struggle with getting or staying to sleep. If your brain starts to be like, no, no, this is what I do here, it will slowly catch up. So for years, I have terrible insomnia, and for years, and it still happens, I go to sleep at midnight, and I wake up at three, and I'm just done sleeping. If you're one of those people, part of that routine is if you are up in the middle of the night, you do not stay in bed for more than a half hour. So when you do all of your self-soothing, whatever it is, if it's a podcast or if it's like, okay, I'm just going to try to count sheep or do some breathing, whatever the thing is, if a half hour goes by and you are not back asleep, get up. Get up. You can keep the lights low, go to the living room. Sometimes I just do some gentle stretching. Sometimes I just make some more milk. Sometimes I go read on my couch until I feel my eyes starting to drop and then you go back to bed so that you're always programming your mind that is for sleep, that is for sleep. Um, setting up for success, set phone alarms, set yourself reminders, especially if you're, it feels weird as adults to give ourselves bedtimes again, right? We're used to okay, do whatever we want, but it helps to keep the routine so that your body gets in the vibe. Um, making sure you get enough sleep, we talked about that a little bit. One thing that I found super helpful, uh, there is a app called, it's free, called Sleep Cycle. I use it all the time. I just plug my phone in, I hit a button before I go to bed, and it tracks my sleep. So it tells me how many times I woke up in the night. It tells me if I was only sort of, if this is my chart, if I sort of stayed up here in really light sleep, if I got down into deep sleep. But one really nice thing about the sleep alarm, and this is where I lose a lot of people, is it wakes you up at the best part of your sleep cycle. So say I need to be up for 6.30 in the morning, I set the alarm for 6.30, and it will wake me up, up to a half hour before that, never after, at the best point in my sleep cycle. So the best point to wake me up might be 6.29, but the best part might also be 6.05 to wake me up. And when I first heard that, that that was part of the alarm, I was like, I don't want to do that. That extra half hour is so important. But what I've learned the last two and a half years since using that nap, I don't often wake up and then have to like fight myself to get going all day. You know when you wake up and you're just really groggy and you can't quite get with it? That goes away because it's, it's woken you up when you are already at the most awake state. So yeah, I might lose 20 minutes that I saw as valuable sleep, but I'll actually probably be more functional for the day. And I usually just take that time to be lazy, play in bed, go, go a little slower for my morning shower, right? Like, you can take the time for yourself. Um, good. Troubleshooting. This is stuff that, not just for sleeping, but helpful for sleeping, but just also good for stress management, breathing exercises. Most of us don't breathe properly. Again, part of that comes from the chronic sitting. We have a huge muscle, your diaphragm, that comes all the way through the inside of your rib cage. When you inhale, it inflates and it pulls the lungs up as you suck all the air in, and as you exhale, it squeezes tight and pushes all the CO2 out. It's a big help. Most of us don't belly breathe. Anyone who's had kids, you know, when you look at your like toddler, your baby sleeping, their belly is moving, they're relaxed. We don't do that as adults. Many things we've forgotten to do. We've forgotten to learn how to play as we've grown older. We've also forgotten to learn how to breathe. We all do it from here. So when you're breathing from your chest instead of your belly, now you no longer have this pump at the bottom of your breathing mechanism to pull all the air up. And instead, we're relying on tiny little muscles in through the neck to help pull your rib cage up. Those muscles are secondary muscles of respiration, so that is their function. They are function to help pull the rib cage up, but really only like if you're coughing or sneezing, right? Like things that we don't do all the time are not meant to do that. And so what happens is with our short breathing, these muscles are lifting all this stuff and they get tired. So then our neck starts to get tight and you get what I call turtleneck, right? your head starts coming forward, especially for most of us who are sitting all day, this starts happening. Then we have neck pain. 
So that's bad because your head is built to evenly distribute. Your spine kind of looks like a pyramid, so the vertebrae at the top are really small, the vertebrae at the bottom are really big. And then of course your skull is on top. So skull, brain, hair assumes 12 to 16 pounds per person sitting on the top of your head. When your neck comes forward an inch, it adds an extra 20 pounds of pressure going through your spine for every inch your head comes forward. So of course your neck hurts, of course your shoulders hurt, right? Because most of us are doing this and then you, we wonder why, right? We're no longer distributing that force nice and easily all the way down the spine. It's got to, all those muscles are doing jobs they're not meant to do. So, um, breathing exercise is super helpful for the postural pain, super helpful to get you to sleep. Sounds cheesy, honestly, the easiest thing to do, roll on your back, put your hands on your belly, and just as you inhale, it's like a balloon. You want the balloon to get nice and big. As you exhale, it should drop down. If you try that and you're like, wow, that was surprisingly hard, because it will be for some people in this room, it will feel almost impossible. Just do three breaths. And then maybe in a couple of weeks, it comes up to five breaths. Um, for the non-sleepers in the room, I like to play a game of how slow can I make my breath compared to my partner beside me. So usually I know if I can slow it down for every three breaths of his, I'm taking one breath, I fall asleep pretty quick after. It can be a nice thing that gives you just enough for your brain to focus on so that you don't get into the like, oh, I have to get this at the store tomorrow and crap, did we pay that bill? Did we call Uncle Joe back? Whatever, right? Like our brain gets on the little treadmill. Breathing exercises can be really helpful when we're trying to sleep to keep you off the treadmill, especially if you have your hands on your belly and you can feel the movement because you're engaging more and more of your senses, you have more and more focal points. Um, any questions? Okay. You guys are so silent. Uh, supplements can be really helpful for sleep. Again, outside of my scope a bit, I, I will say, um, but there, there is stuff that can be good. Uh, Melatonin helps us go to sleep. Melatonin and serotonin are hormones in our brain that work opposite. Serotonin is our happy hormone. So especially if you know that you're prone to depression, whether it's seasonal or like sporadic or there's something happening in your life, you're gonna wanna look at supporting your sleep. Melatonin can be good for that. It's like over the counter, get it everywhere. Of course, before you go out and buy supplements and things, especially if you're on any other medications, make sure you talk to your doctor. Um, but for most people, it's, it's an accessible tool. Valerian root's a good one. Um, I tried everything under the sun. I did it all. And I think when I got down to only sleeping for about 45 minutes a night after six months of that, and I was really, really tired, I finally found a supplement that I really love. It's by Natural Factors. It costs like $15 at the grocery store. It's called Tranquil Sleep. And it's a combination of, it's got a couple different things in it, but it works on soothing the nervous system as well as supporting the sleep hormones. So for the anxious folk, if the anxiety is part of what keeps you up, it may be helpful. Again, talk to your doctor, but there's lots of stuff that's fairly inexpensive, uh, like 15 bucks or less for 120 capsules that can help. So don't lay there tossing and turning, being frustrated all night, try some of these things. Okay. We talked a little bit about breathing. We talked a little bit about breathing already. Um, the main thing here is that breathing is central to the rest of it. If we don't breathe, things start to die in the body, right? Brain, brain health starts to erode after four minutes of lack of oxygen. So we need to do it consistently. Um, and it's really important because it affects our nervous system, which regulates everything. Our nervous system regulates our hormones, it regulates the electrical impulses, which regulates all of our movements and our thoughts. Um, we talked already a little bit about, about the belly breathing and wanting to come down into the belly. This is important because the average person breathes 12 to 15 breaths a minute. That works out to over 20,000 breaths a day. That's a lot to be doing something wrong. <laughs> or wrong is a hard word, but it's a, that's a lot of breaths to be doing something inefficiently, right? So we want to work at bringing something in. Um, I know that not everyone is into yoga and meditation and those things. 
I am though, so you get to hear about it. <laughs> but you don't have to be uh, like, I'm going to go to Lululemon and head to toe and go to the studio every day to get some benefits. And breathing is one of the best things you can do. It's a nice way to start the day, especially if you know you've got a long run or crazy family stuff going on. Every morning when my alarm goes off, I have another alarm that I set for five minutes and I just roll on my back and I put my hands on my belly and I just breathe. And on the really tired days, I fall back asleep and it doesn't matter, there's another alarm to catch me. But on lots of the days where I don't fall back asleep, it gives me an opportunity to just start from a centered place and then it's easier, right? As opposed to like always constantly reacting to what's around you. And usually because I've taken that couple of minutes in the morning to center, I catch myself getting frustrated as the day goes on and it's been years of practice, but now I'm like, okay, you just need to like stop and take a breath. We, we say it to our kids all the time, right? You know, just go take a couple breaths and walk it off when you're not yelling at me. You know, come back, right? We need to take that advice for ourselves. One of the things that proper breathing does is it helps to engage the relaxation response. So we're helping to soothe out our nervous systems. We're going to be engaging the proper muscles of breathing instead of overloading our already overloaded postural muscles. Um, and it helps, a really big one of proper breathing is it helps to support our immune system. So especially if you're one of those people that's like always getting sick or always fighting something, it's, it's a good sign that your immune system needs a little love, which means you need to spend more time out of the stress and into the relaxation zone. Um, yeah, so belly breathing is a really good one. Like I said, use your hands, it gives you something physical, so it gives your brain that tactile response to like, oh, okay, I can feel. And it doesn't have to be big. All of this stuff is designed to be two minutes or less so that you can just sort of pick and choose and take it with you. The hardest part is remembering. <laughs> Movement. I wouldn't be a very good yoga teacher if I didn't talk about moving. Um, but yeah, so yoga is my deal. For most of the people in the room, it's not going to be yours. And that's OK. It doesn't have to be. Uh, according to Canada Health Guides, you're supposed to keep your heart rate up for three different intervals at 20 minutes a week to maintain heart health. I listened to, <coughs> the stats are a year old now, but I was listening to CBC last year and I was heartbroken to hear. They've done long-term studies between Canada and the US. 10,000 steps a day is what you need to maintain basic heart health. Americans on average do 3,900 a day. And I was like, oh yeah, Canadians have got to be better than that. Do your mental guess of where you think we landed. 4,200. Less than half. For not even improving cardiac health, for basic maintenance. <clears throat> for a lot of you guys, doing the long hauls sucks, especially if you don't feel well or if you're already in pain. You're not going to want to go to the gym at the end of a long day. It's normal, right? But just go for a walk around the block. Dog is really good for that. <laughs> yeah, they keep you out even in this weather, right? But just little things, right? Can I take the stairs more? When I go to the grocery store, what happens if I park a little further away? Maybe not in frostbite warning weather, right? But most days, like most days, it's not minus 35 or whatever inside, right? Can I can I just sneak a little couple extra steps in where I go? If you're on the road, right? Park and then just see on your break, okay, I'm gonna eat for a little bit, can I, can I just walk for five minutes? It doesn't have to be like, I'm going to the gym and I'm lifting all these crazy exercises, but where can I just sneak a little more movement into your day? For the office workers or for people who are in the office, this is, goes really well with your drinking water, right? Oh, if I have a small cup and I have to go fill it up and I gotta walk and go get the water, it's not huge, but a couple hundred extra steps here and there changes your mentality. When I first got a Fitbit, I averaged about 7,000 steps a day. Before my Fitbit died, I unfortunately don't have good data, but because I just started being more mindful about how I was moving, it depends if I was going for a run that day or not, but on the days that I don't run, I typically did about 12 to 1,400 steps. And then when I was running, I would do an extra 10K on top of that. All it took was being mindful. Because we know these things, but you're like, yeah, 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 I probably get enough water, and like, I probably didn't eat that much, right? But then when you start tracking 
your intakes of things, whether it's sleep, whether it's food, whether it's exercise and steps, right? We, we get a little bit of a reality check. It's like the group project thing. Everybody in a group project feels like they did two thirds of the work, even though there might be six of you on the team. And the truth is, is we usually overestimate the good that we do and we underestimate the bad that we do. It's just human nature, right? We wanna think that we're awesome at everything. So sneaking in some movement. Movement is good. These are all of the good things that it does for you in whatever form. So you're reducing both postural stress, but also stress on the nervous system, uh, reducing symptoms of anxiety and depression. You're going to increase strength and muscle tone. This is a big one. This comes from things like breathing exercises and meditation. It helps to grow gray matter in the brain. Exercises that have repetitive motion, so walking, rowing, yoga, anything, even weightlifting. It gets your brain into almost a meditative state, even if you're being aware of what you're doing, and it's going to improve gray matter in the brain. That's important because the gray matter lives in your prefrontal cortex, and that's where all the electrical communication in your brain happens. So when that part of our brain starts to erode, we break down. And that's actually what you see in Alzheimer's patients. In Alzheimer's, the brain tunnels actually erode. So uh, I was fortunate enough a couple years ago to get to go to a cadaver lab, and they show you uh, brains that have had various dementia-based ailments, and those actual little tunnels of the brain grow right out. It's not going to prevent that, but there are studies coming out that meditation practices, things that grow gray matter, help with resiliency against these diseases later in life. So that's always good to know. Um, Yeah, gray matter. So in gray matter, we see muscle control, sensory perception, all of our all of our senses. So sight, hearing, touch, memory. Our feelings are stored there. Speech, decision making, uh, and self control all happen in that part of the brain. So it's good to do these things that are going to help grow that part of the brain. Uh, improve cardiac health and circulation. We need our tickers. We don't go very far without them. It's good to maintain those. That's also going to help. You're going to see that with lowering blood pressure. You're going to see that with potential weight loss coming through, uh, reduced heart rate, and improved cholesterol levels, right? Especially if you know that you're like, nah, I'm probably still going to hit the drive through a lot of the time when I'm on the road. You want to make sure that you're balancing out to try to support your heart. Movement practices look different for everybody, like I said. Um, 20 minutes, three times a week. You want to just keep a steady heart rate. There is also damage that can be done by being like, for 20 minutes, I'm gonna go 150%. That's how we hurt ourselves and then never want to go back, right? It's also not very good for your heart. If you haven't gone for a run for five years, getting on a treadmill and expecting yourself to run 5K, you're probably gonna pass out. Like it's not, it's not gonna feel nice. And then we don't wanna do it, right? Start small, start really small. We talked about the 10,000 steps a day. Resistance training is really important as you age, right, we lose muscle strength, we lose coordination. Muscle training doesn't have to be scary. And I know a lot of women are like, well, but I don't want to get bulky if I go to the gym. You won't. Unless you're training like an Olympian, we're probably never going to, you know. Now, men, a lot of them want to do that. You, you know, you can. But, I mean, I go to the gym, I think that's me last week. Those are my little crappy five-pound weights. I don't really do a lot, but I do just enough. You can make anything hard depending on how hard you want to work and what you focus at contracting. Which is something my boyfriend didn't understand, and then we had a gym off one day, and he was trying to get me to do things with like 25 pound weights, and it sucked, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna make you sweat just by standing. And he laughed at me, and he made it 40 seconds, with no weights or anything, just by, okay, contract this, pull this out, resist your own muscle strength, right? You can make walking really like, you can kind of drag your feet and not really do anything, but you can do it really purposefully contract my quad as I go, I'm going to kick my hamstring out, I'm going to drop my foot, I'm coming over. All of a sudden, I'm engaging more and working more. Anything can become a workout if you want it to. And it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be huge, you just got to fit it in. <coughs> Stretching, super good for those things that are always shortening, right? When we're rolling forward, our chest is always shortening. So for most of us, right, that, yeah, you just want to like stretch out, right? Doing, doing some chest stretches where you open up through the side of the chest. The fronts of the hips are a really big one because of the seated. And you'll see when you do get those, those pamphlets, I have a few sort of, you know, heel to your bum, get, get the front of your quads opening again. Just moving 
think about, okay, if I'm, if I'm sitting in this position, I kind of want to do things the uh, opposite, right? The opposite of what we have. Um, the nice thing with all of these things is as you go with repetition, we find our groove and then you start to notice like the little successes, right? I see it all the time in yoga and people are like, I want to touch my toes. And I'm like, cool, but there's a lot you can learn like on the way down, right? And, and like learning those little successes and just little things like waking up and not being in pain. How nice is that, right? Okay. So we talked about this. We're going to help to counteract the sitting posture. So it's going to improve muscle length because you're pulling the origin and the insertion further apart. Um, reducing stress and anxiety. Increasing uh, strength and muscle tone. The brain matter improves. Improving cardiac health and clarity of focus. Again, I am a yoga teacher, so this is my background. But you should know that there are different types of yoga for different things. There's like the crazy hot yoga in a 40 degree room and everyone's super bendy and they move fast, that exists, right? There's that in cold rooms too. There's also classes that are slower that are designed more for flexibility. But the one that I really want to focus on because I think we overlook it is restorative classes. Restorative classes, most studios will have one or two a week. They are incredibly good if you're very stressed, if you've been very sick, or if you're not sleeping well. The goal of restorative yoga is to stretch nothing. It is basically your coziest, most comfortable nap. You're going to use blocks, bolsters, blankets. You sit in each position for five minutes, and the goal is to prop yourself up so that you are as supported as possible, so that you can relax in that shape. It's a good way to reconnect to your breathing, and it's a good way to just slow down. I know it sounds silly. Most of us feel like, well, if I'm going to a yoga class, I should be going to work out. You know, um, but again, a lot of us live in this like floating brain, super, super stress. There is so much benefit to rest. Sometimes rest is the best kind of healing that you can do, especially if you're finding yourself like just sort of at your edge emotionally, right? So know that there, you know, there are different types of yoga classes. There are other kinds of exercise that you can do too, but it's, there is a variety and you can fit it to what you need. Um, speaking of postural pain, we're gonna do a really quick exercise. There's a reason that I showed you this picture where my hands almost touch, okay? So this is my, I'm right-handed, this is my right hand. I work with it a lot, and we live in a very right side, even if you're not right-handed, we live in a very right dominant culture. And we think we use our arms the same way, but we don't. So I'm just gonna get all of you to lean forward off your seats a little bit. Just enough so you can reach your hand behind you. Take your right hand and it's going right up towards the ceiling. Take your left hand behind you, bend at the elbows, and just see where they touch, right? Okay, so just notice everyone's feeling different. Now I'm going to use the pizza. But even look at me. I didn't, I didn't use the, this picture where I can't get there. So even if you're like, yeah, my shoulders don't hurt, you do that and you're like, Ooh, things are very different side to side. I do yoga. So for most of you, if you did that and you can't touch on the one or both sides, you're normal. Yeah? What up? Oh. <laughs> what about the other side? Long arms. Long arms. Here we go. So he's good. That's the other seat. Maybe you need long arms. But if you did that and you can't do it on both sides, I can't do it on both sides, then you're like, Oh, pain doesn't always tell us when things are imbalanced. That's a great stretch. If you did that and you couldn't reach, do it at home with a dishcloth, and you slowly walk your hands closer on the dish. It's a really good one for opening up the rotator cuffs. Um, but it's good to know, right? Like some of you are like, yeah, I have a bad shoulder. You, you might know, but others in this room are gonna go, oh, that looked very different, and I don't feel like it's any different, because our body is genius at adapting without us knowing. Good. Benefits. You guys have him. So, please use them. <laughs> you pay into them. It's good to get them out. Insurance companies don't always love it when I do this spiel, but it is important. Every plan is a little different. I'm not entirely sure of the specifics of your plan. Sometimes you guys need to go and have a doctor for certain services, sometimes for all. But if you are dealing with frequent postural pain or just discomfort, right? 
these are these are the things that I sort of generally refer to and we'll talk about. I, I will also talk about you know massage in a little more depth because I can speak to that. Um, lots of places, lots of clinics will have direct billing. You just have to ask. But think of it this way, you're paying for these benefits and if you're already uncomfortable or you're already in pain, you're throwing away money that could be a solution for yourself. Um, so everyone's self-care looks different. There is no one size fits all. I have clients come in all the time and they're like, who should I predominantly see? What works for me isn't going to work for you. It's different for everybody. Um, I do have a lot of people who come in and they're like, I don't like chiropractors, I've never seen one, but it freaks me out. That's totally common and you're totally allowed to have that opinion, but please know that you can go to a chiropractor and they can do chiropractic care without cracking you. A lot of people don't know that. You just have to go in and tell your practitioner. My sister, funny duck, waited too long, is in chronic pain, messaged me yesterday, I got her in for a treatment, but it was still bad. And I said, honestly, you have to go see the chiropractor. And she was texting me. She's like, but I'm scared. What if I get paralyzed? And I said, then you'll sue for malpractice, and you'll have a reason to never have to work out again. It won't happen. Don't worry. You'll be fine, right? And we had a, we had a good chat. And she went, and she was, oh, you know, it wasn't so bad. But she was nervous about it. And so I tell her the same thing I tell everyone else. If you're nervous about it, or if it's your first time at an appointment, tell your practitioner, hey, I, I don't really know about this cracking business. Maybe we don't do that today. Or, like, th they'll know, right? You're not going to be the first one that's like, I don't know what to do here. They have ways to help make you comfortable. And so that's what happened. My sister went into the appointment with the chiro at my work, and she said, I'm really nervous. He said, OK, are you nervous, and you want me to walk you through it and tell you exactly what I'm doing? Or would you rather just not know when the crack's coming? Or do you not want to have a crack at all today? And so she went, well, I don't know. Let's pick this one. And then she says, you know, it wasn't bad at all. I said, I know, I've been telling you that for 15 years. Just go to the Cairo, right? But it's not for everyone. You might go and not think you really have a problem with it and leave and be like, oh, that wasn't really for me. That happens. If you guys do have coverage, I know that it sucks to have to go through your initial assessment appointment twice. Um, but you, you want, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit. I'll come back to this thought. Uh, different modalities. So, so chiropractors, they don't just do cracking, they do other stuff. If you're nervous about it, just talk to people, talk to them, um, and they should work with you. Osteopaths, a lot of people don't know what those are. Same principle as chiropractor, but instead of high velocity cracking, it's m more slow movements. It's a lot of like moving you through the range of motion. It's even gentler than massage. Not very often, but occasionally I will have patients who are in a lot of pain and direct muscle stuff hurts and so I will send them to an osteo. If you don't know, if you know you don't like deep pressure or if you're really in a lot of pain, it can be a great place to start. Physio is really good. If you have an injury that's just not healing or if you have a chronic condition that's not getting any better, a good physio, there's a big emphasis there, a good physio will give you enough education that will give you stretching and strengthening routines that you should do at home. I know we all hate homework, but they do that because when you do those exercises, it reduces the amount of time that you need to go back into the clinic. Um, but they can be really helpful, especially if you're like, well, I've been driving for 20 years and I blew my disc out a couple of years ago and now I have chronic low back pain. That's where I would suggest you go. Um, naturopaths can be really helpful. Naturopaths, much like a doctor, uh, except they get to spend more time with you and they look at everything. So they're gonna talk diet, they're gonna talk sleep, they're gonna talk all of those things. Sometimes they offer supplements. It can be a nice compliment to the family doctor because as much as you know, our family doctors work hard for us, it's a very overtaxed system and they, you know, we're kind of in and back out the door, right? Whereas a naturopath, if you have coverage, you can take the time. Um, and counseling, mental health is really big too. I don't have a lot of time today to talk about mental health in the, um, sheets that I will have available for you guys next week. There is a mental wellness handout of uh, a local uh, initiative that I'm involved in with the region of Waterloo for mental wellness. Mental health is a really big part of our physical health, especially as we age. Anxiety and depression and just stress levels, they have a massive effect, not only on how everything regulates internally, but just how we can function. So, you know, if you need it, it's there for you. As truck drivers, we are mental. Without? <laughs> As truck drivers, we are mental. Well, you have to deal with a lot of road rage and people, yeah. and yeah. 
right? Like it's gotta be frustrating. So if you have it, use it. Um, I saw today is Bell Let's Talk Day, right? And I saw a great little thing on Instagram this morning that I reposted that said, you know, um, you don't you don't have to be broken. There doesn't have to be something wrong with you to go see a therapist. And I'm a big fan of this. I tell everyone I currently have two because I'm working on a whole bunch of different stuff, right? And like, I don't think of myself, I think of myself as pretty high functioning and busy, but sometimes it's just good to have a different perspective or sometimes, you know, like there was a period where I was sleeping for 45 minutes a night. And I was like, yeah, you know what? Maybe it's time to rebook in. And maybe you know, it's a really nice manual way to relieve pressure in the body. It's gonna decrease feelings of stress and anxiety. Because it's soothing and it's repetitious, it puts you into the relaxation state pretty easily, which instantly is starting to do things to repair your gut, to support your immune system, and your body stops pumping out the stress hormones that are otherwise going. And that's gonna help reduce muscle pain and tension. Uh, we're improving circulation because you've got someone manually doing stuff. So if you do have circulatory disorders, uh, massage can be really helpful. The only problem is, is if you know you have very high blood pressure, there is a cutoff because we don't want to overcook things on the heart. So if you have high blood pressure but you want to try massage, it's a good conversation to have with your massage therapist. Um, the other thing that can be nice is, again, the floating brain when our bodies are in a lot of pain and we check out. Massage can be nice because tip Typically, it's enjoyable while it's happening, and so you start to reconnect to your body that's not in a pain state, and you stop kind of floating up here so much. Um, yeah. So we talked, I said we were gonna come back to it. This is, this is the pin in it that we're revisiting. Hiring your best team. So if you are gonna go ahead with your benefits and stuff, a couple of things to be aware of. Know your goals. Why are you going? What do you want to do? You want to feel better? Okay, what does feeling better look like? Is it maybe one headache a week instead of five? Is it not having, you know, what, what does it look like? What, it, like smart goals, right? Specific, measurable, attainable, like all of these things. You want to really know what are you doing? And then the next question is, okay, now we know what we want to do. How are you going to get there? So um, picking your modalities if it comes down to using your benefits and hiring people. And I, I do have a couple um, you know, pointers, things to think about when you're hiring a healthcare team. Um, other things that are important in identifying your goals and doing research, think about what extras you might need. Do you need direct billing? Are you not willing to pay for it up front? Then you want to make sure you find a clinic that has that. Do you need parking on site? Or are you okay if there's a parking lot? Like at my clinic, we only have on parks on-site parking in the evenings, otherwise you have to walk a block or two. That might not be accessible at all times or with your schedule. Um, do you need specific days or hours? Are you always gonna be an only weekend person? Do you always need evenings, right? And for some people, you know, online booking. Most clinics now have online booking and it's awesome because you can come home and just sit with your schedule and figure it out. <coughs> but think about the things that you might need to book an appointment so that you get it right away, as opposed to like, well, I found someone and I really like them, but I can only see them once every three months because their schedules don't line up, right? You're tailoring this around you. Even though you're paying someone who, in theory, has more, you know, they have more experience in that modality, you're hiring them to support you and your goals. So starting by getting really clear about what that is is gonna help the research stage, is gonna make everything go a little smoother. How to look for someone. Usually, when we don't know, we ask other people. Recommendations are awesome, but I will give them with a caution. I can ask Adam, hey, you know, who works best for you? And he can tell me, but he lives in a very different body than I do. He might have different needs. We might like different pressure, right? So he might recommend <coughs> me to whatever, his naturopath, who he swears by, and I might go in and be like, I hated her. This, so there, and then it's very easy to make the loop of, this just isn't for me. Um, which is sort of part of building a healthcare team. Please remember, even if you have benefits that reimburse you most or all of these appointments, you are hiring these people to support your goals. So if you go and you're like, well, I don't know if we really mesh, hire someone else. Give, you know, you might go in and be like, wow, I hated that treatment. 
there's a hundred different ways to massage people. There's a hundred different ways to apply technique. Just try someone new. If you've already got the coverage, you're not paying out of pocket. And if you try twice and you're like, yep, Cairo massage, whatever it was, just doesn't work for you, then it doesn't work and you know. But you're hiring people, right? So all of a sudden, and it happens, my schedule's changed and I've lost clients over it because they're like, sorry, I really needed those evenings and now you're only available too. Okay. Let's, let's help find you someone. And that can be another thing too. If you're seeing someone and they leave, you can ask for referrals. Or if you're seeing, I have people come in all the time. Someone texted me yesterday. Hey, I've been coming and seeing you for a while. I think I want to try physio. Where would you send me? Now, a lot of times clinics will try to keep you in-house. A, because you know the practitioners. And B, it's just less driving from whoever's coming. But you can say, yeah, I've tried that. It actually didn't work for me. Who else would you recommend? Right? You're hiring these people to help you um, and you want that to work around what your goals are right your added needs whether it's the parking whether it's the hours whether it's direct billing or other things I haven't thought of but those are, are generally really common reviews online can be helpful but again with a wary eye right everybody these practices come down to human beings so it might be great for someone and it might not work for you someone might have a horrible experience and that might not have been your experience at all right so it's kind of like when you're looking where to go for dinner on Yelp you know <laughs> we keep it with a grain of salt when you're doing recommendations but just try um, and then the other part is maintaining a schedule of self-care especially for the parents in the room you guys are always at the bottom of this you know take care of list everybody else comes first and it gets really easy when life is busy and our jobs are long to just come home and not want to. One of the best things that you can do for yourself is to have stuff that's just scheduled regularly. So everyone does this differently. I have clients who come in and then they'll schedule their next appointment before they leave. I have people who do it six months at a time. Everyone runs their life a little differently. But if you wait until you hurt or if you wait until you're injured, it just takes that much longer to get back up to health. Preventative health is a thing for a reason, right? Because it's easier to solve a problem before it gets serious or before it even starts, as opposed to, okay, now I've got a massive tear and it's gonna take several appointments to fix and I've gotta fit them all in and I'm uncomfortable in the meantime. So, however you schedule your life, find ways to schedule that or schedule your reminders, right? Hey, it's been two weeks, how long do you need? Good old Google alarm is always really good for that. Booking in advance. Um, the other thing that I do at home for home practices, if I'm not filling up my Google calendar incessantly with reminders, is post-it notes or um, whiteboard markers. You can write them on your mirrors and erase it really easy. There's always a note on the bathroom mirror because when I get up in the morning and I'm brushing my teeth, and it'll be like, oh yeah, you're working on stretching out your calves. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I can do that. I'm brushing my teeth, right? Or like, oh, oh yeah, there's a smoothie in the fridge. Don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. Hopefully your brother-in-law doesn't eat your lunch on you on the regular. That happens at our house sometimes. <laughs> don't eat my lunch. Anyways, but, you know, because I've done it. I've spent hours meal prepping, and then I get to work. I'm like, man, I'm hungry. No, it's all in the fridge at home because it was a new habit. I wasn't in the habit of taking the lunch sticky notes and post-it notes and accountability buddies, right? To check in with you and be like, are you doing the thing? And like, no, I'm not doing the thing. Well, how do you feel not doing the thing? Well, I feel hungry or like I haven't stretched in a week so I feel sore. And like, oh, okay, maybe I could choose something different and hope for a different result, right? Albert Einstein's very famous for that saying of the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and genuinely expecting a different result. So if you know that you're hurting at the end of the day, Hopefully there's some good tools in here that will help you figure, you know, figure out some places to start. Um, I'm pretty friendly. There are ways to hang out with me online or just, I put a lot of stuff up with stretching tips or, I don't know, you yeah. follow me on yeah. my post. Yeah, all kinds of great stuff, but, you know, it's... I try to practice what I preach, yeah. but it's free. It's yeah, amazing. I think it just, just as a recap, um, just going over this in my head, just for everyone here, for all the drivers, um, you know, try to take some of these things that Megan has talked about today and apply it to to your world, okay? Especially with uh, the breathing exercises. You know, when we're sitting in traffic, uh, when we're stuck at the border, stressful times like this, uh, you can apply things like this. Um, you know, the big thing for me, and I, I've talked about this before in orientation and in, and in other things that we've done, 
Yeah, your bunk area, your sleeping area is so important. You've got to make sure that it's comfortable. Um, make sure you've got plenty of blankets and that you can get a good night's sleep. Turn your Qualcomm's down, okay, and so that they're not waking you up in the middle uh, of your sleep, that kind of thing. Um, the, the apps that you talked about today are also really good. You can start utilizing those if you want, tracking your, your food, uh, you know, increasing your water intake, all that stuff. It, it's all really great things. Uh, again, it starts small, um, but uh, that's how we change, right? So. Yeah, small sustainable change will help you. Um, one of the things I just passed around now, that's sort of my relaxation care. So I know not everyone's bath person, so you might not love that last, the bath idea. But even if you're not a bath person, when we're stressed, our body depletes in magnesium, which is what Epsom salts is high in. So if you're going through a super stressful period, or for drivers, especially in the summer with the heat, if you notice that you're getting like ankle swelling, leg swelling, and stuff because of the circulation at the end of the day, doing foot baths, like even just sitting on the side of your tub or getting a little bin from the dollar store and just sitting for 10 minutes with a cup of Epsom salts in there, your body will absorb the magnesium and it will help support your circulatory system. Also very good for heart health. Um, what else is on there? I think that there's the belly breathing exercise, so you have a little bit of a guide through that. And then there's a restorative yoga pose with um, a bolster up your back and your feet up the wall. If you don't have a bolster, take a towel, roll it up long lines. When you're laying with that up the spine, what it does is it, it supports the center of the body so that as you lay back, your chest, your shoulders can open back out, right? We're, we're counteracting this position. Also very good for circulatory issues because your feet are up high. It's sort of like when we restart a computer, it gets a little reboot. Legs up the wall is the same kind of thing because our heart is down low as opposed to up at the top of our body or you know, the top third of our body. And so it, it, it causes a flush. I also have, and I don't have a ton of time, I want to let you guys go, but I should have, these are my uh, low-tech bouncy balls. They are your best friend. For anyone who's seen like the bigger tune-up balls, it's the same kind of idea, but these get into your neck and your forearms a lot easier. So you literally, it doesn't feel nice when it pulls your hair, so if you have that, move it out of the way, but you can use it to just roll up and down. Um, Obviously, please don't do it while you're physically driving, but it can be nice if you come home and like watch the news every night, just to have 10 minutes to, to roll out. I don't know if you've ever tried to massage your own neck, but it's hard. I can't do it. This is, this is what I do in between my visits, and it just helps, especially if you're someone who gets reoccurring headaches. They can be really helpful. So you can come up, you can grab one of those. I also have some information about the clinic that I work at. I do work in Uptown Waterloo. I do work at a multidisciplinary, so we have seven RMTs, a naturopath, a physio, an osteopath, and a chiropractor. Lots of clinics will also have that. Um, and then for anyone who is interested in yoga, I have some free class passes to the studio I work at downtown. Um, and then next week, I will get you guys the mental health and then the stretching for drivers as well. So when you guys are, if you're around, come by and see me. I'll have those available to you. Um, I'm going to send some up to Rochester as well so they have them. Uh, but uh, yeah, so yeah, and then like I said, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. Every two weeks or so from my website, I launch um, a newsletter and I usually will send out like something, some sort of free, like a free 10 minute little practice of stretching or like just stuff like this, like stuff like this that I talk about that I find so many people are like, oh, that's really helpful, right? Little ways to make life easier. So if you want to do that, you can totally do that. Um, you can email me if you have questions. Any anything? Any questions about any of them? Good. So hopefully that's helpful. Hopefully you know there's some stuff there. Come talk. Make sure you grab a bouncy ball so that you have it and uh, have a great day. Thanks for coming.